Hello, everyone. Welcome to the presentation, Framing Knowledge You Can Build On. My name is Greg Bates, and I'm coming to you today from Sacramento, California. At our company, we haven't resumed all of our travel just yet, so I appreciate being able to connect with you via Zoom. Uh, West Frazier is a, is a lumber company, and uh, we also produce a number of different wood products. We, in addition to producing lumber and uh, treated lumber, we also produce oriented strand board, plywood, laminated veneer lumber, uh, fiber board, and also particle board. So we make a lot of the products that are used in homes. And earlier this year, West Frazier purchased a company called Norboard, and I actually worked for Norboard. Uh, Norboard is the world's or was the world's largest OSB producer, and we were purchased by the world's largest lumber company. So we, we do now uh, produce a lot of the products that are available to you. And as I mentioned, I'm coming to you from Sacramento, California. I cover this region here shown in the West, and I look forward to getting back out to see you guys uh, soon. So today's topic is uh, going to be kind of focused on engineered wood and, and how we use that in framing. And engineered wood is kind of a funny thing. We start out with a great big piece of wood, and then we cut it into pieces, and then we just glue it all back together again. So what would be the purpose of doing that? Well, actually we can make wood stronger than it was originally because we can work around the strength reducing characteristics of wood. And I'm going to show you a video that explains how plywood is manufactured and you can see the benefits of using veneers glued together to make a panel. I'm holding five plywood veneers. The grain direction for each veneer is shown by the black tape with the grain direction being the same for each veneer, together they are weak and flexible in one direction and strong and stiff in the other direction. To have a product that is strong and stiff in both directions, we can alternate the grain direction of the veneers And now when I flex these veneers, they are strong and stiff in this direction, and they are also strong and stiff in this direction. Also, the advantage of engineered wood is that if any one veneer has a strength reducing characteristic, it will only affect the strength of this one veneer and not the entire product. So you can see how we can optimize the wood grain for strength. And then going to point number two here, if we can make the product stronger than it was originally, we can use less wood fiber to carry the loads that we need to have in our structures. And also another advantage of using engineered wood or having this wood available to us is improved species utilization. For example, we make a lot of our OSB that's produced in the West that comes into your market from Aspen. And Aspen is a tree that, that grows very quickly and it replants itself. You don't have to go back and replant, but it's really not useful for lumber or it's not useful for making plywood, but it's an excellent product for making OSB. So that's uh, another advantage. Here's a listing of different kinds of engineered wood products. We just talked about plywood and OSB or sheathing products. And then we have this category of beams and headers. Here we, uh, we use smaller pieces of wood, but we orient all the wood grain going in the same direction. And the beams and headers are used for carrying larger loads. And then we also have studs and rim board. And again, the grain is optimized and, and the layup is optimized for strength. And then there's also the wood eye joist, which uses a number of different products to, uh, to make up it, that as a member. I want to talk to you just uh, briefly about uh, glue lamb beams. And here you see a glue lamb beam used as a garage door header. And for example, here we have a knot. And because this overall beam is made from many laminations, this not only affects the strength of a single lamination and not the entire member. And when it comes to these laminations, the, each of these laminations are, are graded and optimized for their placement within the beam. So we have two different kinds of beams that we want to know about. One is called a balanced beam, and the other one is an unbalanced beam. A balanced beam has a neutral axis that is right in the middle, and then the, the grade of the lumber is the same about the center of the beam. And this is used for a, uh, in a continuous span condition where you need to have strength on both the top and the bottom of the beam. But when it comes to an unbalanced beam, like that garage door header that we just saw, that will be made with a 
an unbalanced layup because we need to have the strongest wood at the very bottom of the beam. And then we can use lower grades um, at the very top and then even lower grades in the very middle of the beam. So when we do have a beam that is an unbalanced beam, you will see a top stamp on the beam. And that is going to go up so that when you actually install the beam from the ground, you will not be able to read the top stamp anymore. So if you're looking up at a glue lamp beam and you can see the word top, that would mean turn over please in that situation. And before you flip the beam, you might wanna check with your engineers to see if it will work in that orientation. Maybe the beam was oversized and has extra strength, but if it was kind of designed at the limit state, uh, then turning it over would be necessary. Another kind of engineered wood product is laminated veneer lumber. So when I was demonstrating those veneers, I had them all oriented in the same direction to start with. And that's really what LVL is. It's veneers that are all going parallel in terms of their grain direction to optimize the strength of a beam. Now here's a map of North America and the green areas represent forested areas and the dark green areas represent concentrated forest areas. And I wanna ask you a question. Um, as time passes, how long will it take this forest land that we see here, considering it all together, to grow enough wood fiber so that we can make 100 boxcars of OSB? So if you can imagine 100 boxcars all filled with OSB, how long would it take the forest land to produce that much fiber? Is it one minute? one year, five years, or 25 years? And you know, since I'm asking the question, it's gonna be either A or D, one of the extremes. And the answer is actually just one minute. As all that wood is constantly growing and the time that we've been talking right now, we've been able to produce uh, the, the wood for, or the forest land has grown enough wood to make 500 <laughs> boxcars of OSB. So just wanna talk a little bit more about wood. Uh, APA comes out with these Friday facts, and here's one I collected from May 7th of this year. And it says that the forest products industry replants more than 1 billion trees a year, or nearly 3 million trees every day. So we actually have, we actually have more wood fiber now than we did 50 years ago. And here was another Friday fact. It says in the U.S. there are roughly 20% more trees than there were 50 years ago. So we're going in the right direction. We're not running out of wood fiber. Actually, we're getting more and more wood fiber. And as we go through the presentation today, I'll be stopping at points to ask if there's any question. I'm just gonna go ahead and, and press through to the next, uh, just be another few minutes here. We get to the next break for some questions just to try to catch us up on time a little bit. So I wanna give you uh, just a photograph tour of an OSB mill. Here's a log truck. We certainly start out with these uh, smaller, faster growing trees. These would be trees that are really too small for making plywood. You can see how small some of these trees are. They're, they're quite small, but they work out very well for making OSB. And then here you see in the background, we get quite a pile of trees stacked up and that's gonna last us for a while. And then we bring these trees uh, using this, this um, tool here, this grabber here to bring the logs into the mill. And the pictures I'm showing you are from a couple of different mills. So you might look a little bit discontinuous, but here we're bringing some logs into the mill and they're gonna go into this hopper and begin the process. One of those processes is debarking. So we don't use uh, the bark in the OSB or plywood that gets taken off. And then we strand these trees to make those small strands that you see in OSB. And it's hard to get near that machine because it's, um, it's quite a powerful machine and we need to stay back. But once we have these strands, they go through this really big dryer and they tumble through this dryer from one end to the next. And you can kind of get a, sigh, a feel for the scale of this. I mean, here is a ladder. So uh, probably the average person would be about this tall standing next to this ladder. So that's a very big dryer. And then after it goes to the dryer, it go, goes, all those strands go through another large cylinder and, they, and then they tumble again. And this time they're actually getting resin put onto the, all the fibers. After that, we arrange the strands just like plywood veneers are arranged. These, these, these strands are actually perpendicular to each other in layers. And this is what we call the mat. And then it goes into the press. 
the whole process is controlled from this control room that you see here. It seems like it's Homer Simpson's place at work, all these knobs and switches and screens everywhere. And they really control the whole process from this control room right here. And here we see board coming out of the press and you can see it's already been edge cut along the sides here. And then in a moment here, we'll talk about it's, uh, it's cutting to actual size. And then even before we, we cut it into smaller pieces, we put nail lines on that you see here. And here is some branding of one of our products that is sold in your area. Now here is a whole stack of these master panels. Different mills uh, saw the panels differently. At this particular mill, they go through a, a gang saw where we cut several panels at one time. So these panels are very large. You're going to be cut in half this way and then three times or two, twice in that direction to make a total of six panels. So this is a stack that's probably three feet tall. And we feed a stack of panels, maybe about five or six uh, inches in thickness through the saws all at one time to make the individual panels. And then here you see in our mill, we have finished product stacked up. And then over on the right hand side, this is a rail car. We can bring about five or I think about five rail cars right into the mill. And then we can load the rail cars inside so we don't have to go outside in the winter time and, and have things get wet. So any questions on anything that we've talked about so far regarding engineered wood or the manufacturing of, of OSB? I'll just Sounds like we've got there. lots of product, but it seems awfully expensive. Is it quite an expensive process? Well, the expense right now is really for market conditions. As you know, it's a commodity market, so it's kind of essentially like an auction every day to see um, who's willing to pay for the product on that particular day. And um, we know that, that lumber has certainly come down in price, and I think earlier this week, uh, random lengths printed maybe flat for OSB. So we'll, we'll just have to see what, what goes on in the future. I can't talk about anything uh, forward telling, but prices do go up and down. They have in the past. <laughs> anything else? Okay, I'll just go ahead and move on. When it comes to panels, plywood or OSB, they are manufactured to certain standards. I'll be brief here and just say that one of these is called PS1. And the next one is called PS2. That second number is just the year that the standard came out. And we have certainly updated standards uh, since 2010. One of these is for making plywood and then the other one is for plywood and OSB. This one is a performance standard, whereas this one is a prescriptive standard. So when you consider OSB and plywood, plywood these products are interchangeable when they are used as intended. So for wall sheathing or floor sheathing or, or roof sheathing, these products are interchangeable. And today I want to talk just briefly about some of the items in the AP trademark, just these items in blue. Those are essential for us to know. And then I'll just point out that here is that marking PS2, that's the manufacturing standard. So that means that this product is code compliant. Well, let's start out talking about the span rating. That's important for a proper installation. Here on this panel, it says that it is a rated sturdy floor panel. So this is a panel that is used for subfloors. And a sturdy floor panel is actually manufactured to be two panels in one. It is underlayment and uh, subfloor all in one panel. So it's designed to resist concentrated and impact loads. So getting to the span rating, this means at 24 OC that these supports can be up to a maximum of 24 inches on center, but not farther apart. So for this panel, 16 inches on center would be fine, as would be 19.2 inches. <clears throat> Now in this APA trademark, this product is called rated sheathing. Rated sheathing is a general purpose sheathing panel that you can use as subfloors, walls, and roofs. If it is used as subfloor, it's recommended that you add a second layer of underlayment on top of that. So this span rating is a little bit different. There are actually two numbers. The first number is the maximum distance between supports for a roof application. And then the second number at 16 is the maximum distance between supports for a floor application. 
So why don't we just use the same support spacings for floors and for roofs? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, the reason for that is because we need to have our floors be stronger than our roofs. So I'm gonna try and explain that with this slide. So whenever you see a number, like when a number is by itself, that's gonna be for a floor. And then when you see two numbers together, the second number is for the floor. So these numbers that I have circled here will give you a 100 pound live load. And that's the load that we wanna have for a floor application. But when it comes to roofs, they don't need to be as strong. So that we have these numbers here that, that is orange uh, to me on this end. And since our floor or our roofs don't have to be as strong as our floors, uh, at that kind of a span rating or support spacing, our panels will have a 30 pound live load and also a little bit more deflection than would be permitted for a floor. So that's why we have two different numbers because the strength characteristics of floors and roofs are different. So <clears throat> just want to reinforce a couple of key points as we go through here with some quiz questions. I'll just go ahead and answer these questions for us. Uh, the designation 3216 in the APA trademark indicates a 32 inch maximum roof span, a 16 inch maximum floor span, or both A and B. And the answer is both A and B. Again, the first number is for the roof, the second number is for the floor. And then there is another panel called rated siding. And if you are using the panel grade called rated siding, that single digit number will, could, will correspond to the wall stud spacing. Okay, something else that we wanna talk about is exposure one panels versus exterior panels. And I'll say right now that the vast majority of panels, I'll say 80% or more that are produced in North America are exposure one panels. And exposure one panels can be exposed to the weather for a normal construction delay but not on a permanent basis. Exterior panels, they can be exposed to the weather on a permanent basis, but they also need to be finished with paint or stain. So what is the difference? You might think that it's the glue that is different between these two panels, and it's not the glue. They both have exterior glue, but what is different is the wood. So let me try to explain that. When it comes to an exposure one panel that will be made as OSB, a strand-based product, or a plywood product that has degrade veneers within the panel. When it's exterior grade, the OSB, it can still be made from OSB, but one entire side of the OSB will be covered with an overlay so that it can be used for siding. And when it comes to a plywood product, all the veneers in the, in the product will be C grade or better veneers. D grade veneers have larger, uh, well, they permit larger knots and knot holes, and a knot hole can be an entry point for water into the panel that could affect the glue bond. So that's why it's actually not the glue, but the wood that is different. And here we just have a, a silly photo just to show exposure one panels versus exterior panels. If you were going to make a wooden car, I guess I would recommend that you go exterior grade because it will be permanently exposed to the weather. Okay, so which bond classification can be used when the panels will be exposed to a normal construction delay? And that will be exposure one. And again, at least 80% of the panels in North America are manufactured as exposure one. Now I've been, um, I used to work for APA in the 2000s. I was with APA for about nine years. And this next part of the presentation that I'm going to go through next is actually from APA. I've adapted it from one of their presentations and they've allowed me to take it with me as I've gotten into the, uh, into the distribution side of business. So we will talk about these six recommendations for a proper panel installation. And we'll talk about a few other things along the way. But as we've talked about, and as you saw with that veneer demonstration, wood is stronger in one direction than it is in the other. And a good way to think about wood is to think of a bunch of drinking straws. If you had a collection of drinking straws and you tried to push on them or pull them apart, you'll find that it's very strong. 
But if you do anything perpendicular to those drinking straws, you'll find that they are weak. So that's why when we make plywood in OSB, we optimize the grain direction for strength in two different directions. So it's really kind of a neat product how we can modify the wood grain for a flat panel that has strength in two directions. And you might not think that OSB actually has oriented strands. They aren't perfectly oriented, but they are oriented pretty well. And if you stand back and look at a piece of OSB, look at the strands and you'll see that they are primarily going in the same direction. We have one that's a bit straight here, but for the most part, all those are going left to right. So the first three installation recommendations that we have, we'll talk about as a group because they all relate to the span rating and, and the strength of the panel. So let's go ahead and, and get started with these. Even though panels are strong in both directions, they are actually stronger in one direction. And we want to make sure that that strong direction is going perpendicular to supports. So typically, and I'll say uh, almost all cases, like 99% of panels, the strength direction will be in the long panel direction. And we'll want to have that direction going perpendicular to supports. So here our supports are going in this direction. So to install a panel on a floor or a roof, this would be a misinstallation because the panel is not going to perform as we expect it to. This will actually be a weaker installation and we'll consider that to be a misinstallation. So when we have this symbol on the screen, we're talking about a misinstallation. So again, these panels should have been oriented in this direction for a floor or a roof. Okay, number two, when we install the panels, they are to be installed continuous across two or more spans. And this could be when we're talking about floors and roofs again. So. Here's a panel and you can see that it's, it has two spans. So this would be a span and this would be a span, or you might wanna think of this as being three supports, one, two, and three. And what happens when you put a load here or you stand right here, this panel is going to deflect down a little bit, but having this adjacent span actually provides strength to this span. So the panel pulls tight here and it limits the deflection that happens on that side. So when you install a panel like this for a floor or a roof in a simple span, it's gonna feel softer underfoot. It's not gonna have this adjacent um, span here to add some, some stiffness there. So when you do see a panel installed like this, this is actually a misinstallation and the span rating is now void. Because as we saw earlier, this span rating, the 3216 corresponds to a 100 pound live load for a floor or 30 pound live load for a roof. Well, these capacities are no longer there because the panel was misinstalled. So I'm sure you're thinking in your mind, well, man, I think these simple spans, don't they happen all the time? Well, they do happen often. And here I'll show you a couple of photos. This is a floor in a residential home. And this is the exterior wall here on the left hand side. So the building doesn't continue on or the floor doesn't continue on past this wall. So here we have a simple span. We have a support that comes right through like this. And that is a simple span. So how do we avoid this? Well, what the installer would want to do is when they're installing this panel right here, uh, that eight footer, they should cut it back to six feet and just put in six feet of panel length and then finish out this course with a four foot panel. So it's, you wanna trim the panel before the simple span so that you can install a two span condition. And then same again here, either start with a four footer or cut this one back to six feet and then end with a four footer. Okay, now the other thing that we need to know is that panels need to be at least 24 inches wide. You can imagine if we had a full four by eight sheet of plywood or OSB, we would trust its strength and we would know that it has strength to it. But what if we just went and we cut that panel in half? Would you be willing to walk on one of these individual halves? Well, what if we cut 
get into force. Uh, do you want to walk on this one fourth, maybe 30 feet above the ground? Now you're starting to wonder, well, hmm, when have we cut this panel too much? Well, the span rating applies to panels that are 24 inches or wider. So when we get something that is a narrow strip, less than 24 inches, the span rating does not apply anymore. So you might wonder, well, does that ever happen on a job site? And uh, yes, it, it does happen and where it, it can happen. And I've noticed that people have, are, are much better at preventing this. And it can happen at the very top of the roof ridge. So let me just uh, draw in a simple roof here. And you can imagine the installers, I'll put a four foot piece down here and a four foot and then a four foot. And then they might have this little bit left over and they, they put in a narrow width panel right there. Well, that panel should be at least 24 inches wide. Well, what if it's not 24 inches wide? Well, there's a, a couple of things you can do. I think I can show it better using this slide. Let's say this is a larger roof than it is here, but we're working up with four foot panels. And then we would wanna look ahead and say, well, if I, if I went with another four footer, that's gonna leave me with a one foot piece up here. So what I should really do is you know, go with a four foot and then maybe cut this one back to three feet so that then I can put in a two foot piece. If I do have a narrow piece up there, like a four foot and a one foot, now I have to add blocking on both edges of this panel according to the International Building Code. It says that diaphragms have to, diaphragms with pieces less than 24 inches shall be blocked. If you did use the International Residential Code, which is not very common in Salt Lake City, there are some other provisions that you can do. And it just kind of goes through some steps as the panel gets narrower and narrower, more and more strength needs to be added eventually doing blocking at both edges at 12 inches. But I think most of your homes that are being constructed out there are going to require just blocking at both edges once you get less than 24 inches. Okay, so here we've talked about these first three installation recommendations. And let's just go ahead and talk about walls for just a moment. But the question often comes up, should I install my panels horizontally or vertically? And some people would say, I think they're stronger when they're installed horizontally. Actually, this, the shear capacity is the same for panels installed vertically versus horizontally. The advantage of going vertically is that you don't have to put in the blocking. So when we, when we go horizontally, we have to put in blocking between these two panels that is framing lumber behind the panel seam. And the blocking makes these two panels act as a single panel. But when we go vertical, we don't have to do that. So that is a nice reason for going vertical. But a lot of times what happens is when we use these eight foot panels, uh, we still have to put in blocking because they don't reach the full wall height. So you can, in the market, there are nine foot and 10 foot panels available where you can go vertically and, and eliminate the blocking. And we also manufacture a panel that is already designed for your 11 and 7 eighths floor framing. And then you can go all the way up with a single panel and get all that covered with one panel and tie all that framing together. And here's what that would look like, kind of a clean looking wall system when you don't have these smaller panels quilted together. And these are available in your marketplace and they are at lengths that correspond to the floor framing that you're using and also the common wall heights of eight, nine and 10 feet. And there's an example of, of, of just single story applications. Now the, the blocking, it's kind of interesting. Not only does it affect the framer, it usually what I hear is like for a crew to put in blocking on a two story house, it is a half a day just to cut all those pieces and nail them in. But then you have the electrician that comes afterwards and if there's blocking in the wall, then they have to drill holes for their wiring. And then the electrician comes and sometimes uh, the blocking is going to be where a fixture is going to be located. In this case, that was an exterior light. And then they'll have to drill through the blocking to put in plumbing. And then even the insulator needs to work above and below the blocking. If they're using bats, they have to cut bats to fit below and above the blocking. And we know, I think the, the previous presentation I saw a bit of that was on energy and 
We don't want to have any gaps in our insulation. So there's just a lot more cutting that needs to be done precisely when there's blocking in the wall. Plus, this is also a thermal bridge, and it's nice to get that thermal bridge out. Now, this is a topic I, I just put in here just as a caution. There's, I know that you have that the Park City area, which is nice, and there's some uh, snow loads up there that have to be thought about. And sometimes people might just take a rated sheeting panel and substitute a sturdy floor panel. So for example, if they wanted to use 19 30 seconds on the roof, they could buy an APA rated sheeting panel. That is your general purpose sheeting panel that we talked about. And that will give you a live load capacity of 120. But it's kind of interesting. Some people will say, well, hey, let's get those T and G panels up there. That sturdy floor T and G panels of the same thickness. And look, the strength went down to half. So, so I want to caution you about just switching out floor sheeting panels where rated sheeting panels were specified. You'll want to talk to your engineer before you do that. So I'll pause again here. Ooh, I got, I'll have to go quick, quick here for this last part, but any questions uh, so far? Okay, I will go ahead and, and press on. What I want to talk about next is that wood changes inside with various degree, various levels of moisture content. Down here on the bottom, I have uh, moisture content percentages. And then as moisture content goes up, you see that panel expansion occurs. So here's a, the, the, the curve that represents panel expansion for moisture content. When we manufacture plywood in OSB, we do it at a moisture content of about 3%. And then when the panels are installed and living happily ever after, they will have a moisture content of about 10%. But what happens between those two moisture levels? Well, the panels can actually grow a 16th of an inch in both directions. That's why we need to have an eighth inch space on all four sides of the panels. Just going back here for a moment, if the panels get rained on while they're on the job site, they could even grow another 16th of an inch. So that's why we need this full eighth inch panel spacing on all four sides of panels for walls, floors, and roofs. If we don't have that eighth inch space, we can have panel buckling that can occur. And here I'm showing you panel buckling that can occur on the roof. It usually occurs all in the last bay spacing of a piece of roof sheeting. And that buckling can actually be quite a bit. So here we see, excuse me, um, if we took, if we had a 48 inch space and we tried to stuff in a panel that is 48 and an 48 and one eighth inches, the panel will have to buckle up over two inches in the middle. Same again, if we have a fixed space of 96 inches and we put a 96 and an eighth inch panel in there, it's going to bubble up over an inch and a half. So what we actually do is we manufacture our panels a bit undersized to help with the spacing but the panels still need to be spaced. So they're undersized so that you can use a, a space between panels. So here we have some wavy siding. We call that friendly siding when it waves back at us, but no fault of the siding here. What happened was the panels underneath the siding were installed tightly and they bubbled and telegraphed through the siding. So just another quiz question for us. Uh, what if the eighth inch space closes after installation? Do we then reinstall the panels or do we saw curve the edges or do we do nothing? Well, the answer is we do nothing because the panels were originally spaced and the space closed and it worked. So we don't need another eighth inch space. These panels will not continue to grow. But there is a caution for us here in these Western markets where we're building in a seismic zone. And this is a picture I took in the Oakland, California area of buckled wall sheathing. Maybe you guys have experienced something like this, but the reason why it happened is because of all the fasteners that are in the panel. The panel could not grow into this eighth inch space because it was restrained from growing by all these fasteners. They held the panel back, it couldn't move. And that is a risk that we have when we have nails that are four inches on center or closer. And this is a publication from APA that talks about this phenomenon. There are other situations that can cause buckling, 
but this is the one that is most common that I find working in these Western markets. And what APA recommends, and nobody likes the answer, is to tack nail the panels on first and then come back in a couple of days after the panels have acclimated and do the final nailing. And I find that contractors, they'll just take their chances because who has time, right? But something that we need to know about. So why does APA recommend spacing panels an eighth of an inch during installation? Is it for proper ventilation, panel expansion, or water drainage? And the answer is for panel expansion. Okay, let's talk about gluing our subfloor panels. It is recommended that you use a quarter inch bead of glue to prevent floor squeaks. So a quarter inch bead of glue is like about the size of an extension cord in, in thickness. And that's how much glue we should add. So we should actually have the glue squeeze out over the eye joist or joist when we press the panel down. And then here's something that is not done. I've Heard of people doing it, but I've never seen anybody actually put in an eighth inch bead of glue at the tongue and groove joint. And that is also to help prevent floor squeaks. So here you see somebody not using enough glue and this floor is likely to have floor squeaks in it after it's constructed. Now there are panels that are manufactured in your marketplace that can be exposed to the weather for a longer duration. Several manufacturers have a brand. Uh, we have a brand that's called Durastrand and we offer a one year no sand warranty. So if you are building through the winter, check with the manufacturers, they all have different warranties. But if you're gonna be exposed to the weather through the winter time, you may want to, to use a premium panel. It might be a cheaper option for you than having to go back and sand. Let's talk about nailing for a little bit here. We have, Installation recommendation number five. And this is applies to panels installed on the floor, the wall, and the roof. The minimum nailing schedule would be six inches on center at panel ends. So that's going to be here and here. And then at these intermediate supports, our spacing can increase to 12 inches between fasteners. So that would be here and here. So when I'm on a job site and I'm looking over the, the fasteners, I'm looking for nine fasteners on the end and five fasteners at all these intermediate supports and then nine again there. When it comes to wall sheathing, like we see here, the six inches applies to the entire perimeter. So wherever there is an edge for wall sheathing, we have to be, we have to do the edge nailing at six inches on center. And then in the field, it can be 12 inches on center and there is a caveat here where sometimes you need to do six on both. But this last one, this three eighths of an inch edge distance is an important one as well. Here we're showing floor sheathing and we really don't have any fasteners that are where they should be. That would be three eighths of an inch from, from all the edges. Uh, this fastener is a ways back. Uh, this fastener, if it actually is one missed and I'm not seeing a fastener in here. And I've been on job sites when I used to work with APA. I used to go out and look at claims. And when the fasteners get to be far from the edge, the edges can actually lift up with changes in moisture content. So I've seen panels actually lift up hardwood flooring. I've seen panels show right through all the three tab shingles on a roof and you get that picture framing effect. And, and maybe you guys have seen it too. And often that is the result of fasteners not being at the edges of panels allowing the panels to, to flare up. Something else that is important about fastening is having overdriven fasteners. Here you see all these fasteners, they're driven in too deep. And that can be a structural concern. And the reason for that is because if you look at this fastener on the right, the, the fastener, when it comes in contact with the wood, this provides our shear capacity. So when the wind blows or the earth shakes, it's this metal that is in contact with the wood that gives us our strength, our resistance, but we don't have any resistance up here because the fastener was driven in too deep. So effectively, if let's say we bought half inch panels, but our fastener is overdriven by an eighth of an inch, we're only getting three eighths structural resistance to an earthquake or a wind event. So going too deep is just subtracting from our structural capacity. 
So there is a publication from APA that I'll talk about in on the next slide here, but just want to mention that if all of your fasteners are overdriven by a 16th of an inch, that is okay. APA tested that and you're going to be okay. So sometimes you have a building inspector out and they see all these fasteners are overdriven by a little bit. Well, if it's only a 16th of an inch, that is okay. Something else that this publication talks about is if you have fasteners that are overdriven due to the appearance of edge swell. So let me just take a panel here and I'll put in a fastener right here. We have it installed like that. And then these panels are exposed to a lot of rainfall. I'm going to exaggerate some edge swell. So now we, this fastener is gonna look like it's overdriven right in there. Well, if the overdriven appearance is the result of edge swell, that is a situation that you can ignore. So this publication here has really been useful for people that have found themselves in an overdriven fastener situation. It tells you when and when you don't need to be uh, concerned. And this, I can certainly make this available to you if you want to uh, email me. We have about uh, five minutes left here and um, I'll, I'll get us done. I know you guys want to get some lunch. So there are two load paths in a building. There is a vertical load path. This is gravity. And then we have a lateral load path where the, the building gets exerted uh, by wind or an earthquake event. So we have to have strength in two different directions. And the vertical load path is kind of made up uh, in a large part just by stacking things like using the headers over trimmers and and uh, supporting our trusses, our roof trusses under walls. But when it comes to the horizontal load path, all we have to resist those loads are, are our fasteners. So we can use nails and staples and screws, mm -hmm. but you wanna check with the manufacturer to make sure that their fastener is compliant for the application you're using. Um, when it comes to recommendations or when it comes to fastening, the code doesn't always specify all the different kinds of fasteners that are available to you. They just will specify a nail, for example, and then it's up to the installer to make sure that if they do use a screw, that it has the equivalent capacity of the nail. And something else that's kind of interesting here is there's a, this is a whole listing of eight penny nails. And the nail that is supposed to be used for roof sheathing is the eight penny common nail. It has a certain length and also a certain wire diameter. And some people that are not familiar with these, that there are different eight penny nails, they might instead use this eight penny cooler nail. Well, if you use the eight penny cooler nail, you don't get to go at six and 12, like with the common nail, that one is six and 12. This nail you have to put in at four inches and eight inches. So your nailing schedule goes up if you don't use the correct nail. So there's an example of not using the right fastener. Also, if you would switch to maybe a staple, I know in some markets, I haven't really seen this in Salt Lake City, they like to use staples. And a 16 gauge staple that is commonly used has to go in at three inches and six inches. So any questions on any of that? I just have one last section. I'll just highlight a couple of things in these last few slides. And uh, see if we can get back on schedule. But if you have a question, this would be a great time to ask it. I'll, I'll wait for about 10 seconds here. Do you prefer the nail or the staple going into your product? I find it's harder to pull a piece of OSB or something if it's got a staple in it that's final coated over a nail. <clears throat> yes, I, I hear that from several people. It's They like staples because when they've had to remove a panel, boy, it sure is tough getting it off with all those staples. But we don't we don't have a preference. We just um, you know our preference is for code compliance, and both staples and nails are code compliant. And um, you know so the faster and the faster spacing is important to us. So we're flexible on the type. Great question. Anything else? Okay, I'm just going to kind of blast through these last slides. And the point here is that. I just want to talk about some issues that may come up where you want to have more information. And the APA is a great resource for information. They are the Nonprofit Trade Association for Engineered Wood. So that's why I'm mentioning them so often. And I used to work for them for about nine years. Proper storage and handling is key. We want to keep our panels dry. And there's a publication that talks about handling them properly. 
We talked about narrow width panels at the very top of the roof ridge. This uh, publication gives you guidance if you're using the International Residential Code and you do have a narrow width situation. This publication talks about overdriven fasteners, and this is a great one. Uh, if you know a framer, you might want to just uh, tell them about this one. If they ever get challenged by a code person regarding overdriven fasteners, you have a publication where both parties can read this and assess the situation and come up with a, a solution. Sometimes a solution is, a, is to get the engineer involved and to, to assess what's going on. Uh, this is the one that talked about when you have fasteners close together, it can lead to the installation problem of panel buckling. It tells you how you can prevent that from happening and, and what to do if buckling has occurred. Something else that can be an issue is certainly in multifamily construction where we have these drywall carts with lots of drywall on them. We have these little teeny tires that can puncture floors. So should we be rolling these drywall carts up and down our subfloor? Uh, the answer is we should not be doing that unless we actually add just a temporary layer of 23 or 30 seconds on top of those panels to protect them while these carts are going up and down. If you have anybody concerned, a homeowner, whomever, that's concerned about the formaldehyde in panels, this is a publication that can relieve them of any concerns that they have. It just talks about the formaldehyde emissions are so low that they are actually exempt from standards, from construction standards. Uh, sometimes you may have a, a building code inspector not allowing narrow width pieces on shear walls. And you know it's in the code that they have to be 24 inches wide. APA did testing on that and found that if all the pieces that, that, that this shear wall on the left with these narrow six inch strips is as strong, equally as strong as this one that has all 24 inch wide pieces. So uh, finish up here. If you're doing a re-roof, you can actually put the panels on top of the skip sheathing by nailing into the skip sheathing or by nailing to the, to the rafters below. There's a method for each of those. If you are going to use a radiant barrier sheathing, um, you should go ahead and take off that skip sheathing because it diminishes the effectiveness of the radiant barrier sheathing. If you are building a subfloor for hardwood flooring, AP recommends that you step up from minimum code construction um, by one span rating. And this is a publication that talks about that. Uh, floor squeaks, publication that uh, helps you prevent those. Uh, this one for time, I'll, I'll skip over and just also say that if you have large wood buildings that are have dimensions of greater than 80 feet, you'll want to consider putting in temporary expansion joints so that the walls stay plumb and, and the building is nice and square. When you have that accumulation of wood, you know, without a temporary expansion joint, that could have an effect. So I will uh, call it there. If you have any questions, uh, you can reach out to me and uh, I'll just give my email. I should have had it typed out here, but it's Gregory, because we already have a Greg Bates. I'm Gregory dot Bates at westfraser.com. So, all right. Thanks everyone.